going to be talking about definition of a polymer, how they get listed on inventories, exemption versus notification, which is really, really important because just today the U.S. announced that the new fee for PMNs proposed is $16,000. Yay. Exemptions are good. Uh, polymer of low concern criteria, to, to be qualified for the exemption, you need to be low concern. What I want to try and reinforce is polymer regulations have been moving in one direction for a long time, and, and in a very good direction. That momentum has somewhat slowed, and now we're starting to see some cracks, especially in the U.S. with the revision of TSCA. So it's really important to pay attention to what's going on. But there are similarities. You're going to see the same things over and over and over again, although in slightly different ways. Here's the definition of a polymer from the OECD. It's long. So let's break it down. Three components. Molecules must be distributed over a range of molecular weights. Greater than 50% must contain at least three monomers bound to at least one other monomer or other reactant. I call that the three plus one rule. No single molecular weight ligamer can be greater than 50% of the total distribution. If you meet all three of these, you're a polymer. If you don't meet any one of them, you're not a polymer. And also, in some countries, there's additional requirements. Japan and Australia, your number average molecular weight has to be at least 1,000. So, but generally, globally, generally, if you meet this definition, lucky you, you're a polymer. <laughs> Except the U.S. has to be different. The U.S. under TSCA has no statutory definition of a polymer except for the 1995 exemption. The 1995 exemption incorporated the OECD definition. But otherwise, all you have is guidance, and here's the guidance. There has to be a molecular weight distribution, and you have to have a sequence of one or more types of monomers bound to two or more other molecules. Well, gee, that sounds the same, and in spirit, it is the same, but it's less prescriptive. It, didn't, it doesn't have these 50% cutoffs and no one thing can be more than 50%, with the unfortunate effect that something can be a polymer in the US, cross the border into Canada, and not be a polymer anymore, which is not a good situation, but it's something to pay attention to. How are polymers listed? They actually are a compositional category. Here's a listing, 1,3-benzene dicarboxylic acid, polymer with 1,6-hexane diamine and hexane dioic acid, the red, <coughs> the blue, and the green. Monomers can be present in any ratio as long as all are intentionally present. So it could be 99% red, half a percent blue, half a percent green, 50% red, 25% blue, 25% green, doesn't matter. As long as all three are present, that listing covers it. And also, generally, the molecular weight distribution doesn't matter. As long as you meet the definition of a polymer, your number average molecular weight could be a million, 100,000, 10,000, 1,000, it doesn't matter. It's a category. However, there can be um, exceptions to this. In the US, if the inventory listing includes a SNR, that could include molecular weight restrictions or other restrictions for that polymer. In Canada, to make use of a DSL listing for a reduced regulatory requirement polymer, that's their polymer of low concern you must meet that. So if you're looking on the Canada inventory and you find your polymer, the cast number of your polymer, celebrate. If it has the triple R flag, some work needs to be done. You have to figure out if your polymer that you're making meets the triple R requirements. So inventory listings are great, but pay attention to the details. There could be extra stuff there. All right, this exemption versus notification. True exemptions. The EU has a true exemption for the polymer, but you have to register the monomers present at greater than 2% at greater than one metric ton per year. Philippines, all po uh, polymers are exempt if all reactants at greater than 2% are listed on the inventory. Uh, although, as Karen indicated, but the uh, certificate is required for customs clearance. So it's a, it's a true exemption, but you still have to do something. Um, in the US, the exemption is self-actuated. You actually just take it. It's a wondrous thing. Uh, Canada and Taiwan, uh, if you're under one metric ton per year, you don't have to do anything. New Zealand, again, as Karen mentioned, if you're non-hazardous, uh, under that has no criteria, you don't, you don't apply. Or if you are hazardous, you might meet the criteria of a polymer group standard, and that way you don't have to do a, a notification. Uh, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and Canada, 
At greater than one metric ton per year, you have to do a simplified notification. It's a lot easier than a full notification, but you still have to do it. And uh, in China, uh, polymers are low concern, and polymers were all reactants, where all reactants of greater than 2% are listed on that China inventory are eligible. And uh, Taiwan PLC requires the small quantity notification at greater than one metric ton per year, and we'll go a little bit more into detail on those. Here's the point. All jurisdictions have a low concern uh, category. And you may, uh, either you're then eligible for an exemption or you do a limited notification. If you're not polymer low concern, the information requirements keep going up all the way to being treated like a chemical. So how do you do a notification strategy? Well, first of all, establish nomenclature and conduct a thorough inventory search. As we talked about, make sure your polymer isn't already listed that you use the exclusions that are available, you use the, the group listings that are available. If a particular polymer composition is not listed, explore alternatives. Uh, train your R&D to be aware of PLC criteria. You know, they probably don't know, but in a world where things are costing more and more money and taking more and more time, if you can avoid the whole notification process because you can, you can take a low concern exemption, you should do it. Can you define a safe harbor that doesn't require a new polymer notification? Now, I'm a firm believer that the tail should not wag the dog. R&D has to make, they have to make technology that works. They have to make a product that sells. Otherwise, what's the point? But if you can, if they understand what this criteria is, if they understand the safe place they can play, then they can maybe develop polymers that don't need notification. It's a great idea to every year or every two years redo the analysis just to make sure, yep, this polymer still qualifies and put that in the file. If not, do a roadmap for global notification. What do you need or when? Here I'll point out, we just don't have time to go into it, but be, under new Tosca, there are four new concern categories for inhalation, uh, and they hit polymers and they hit them hard. If your polymer has inhalation exposure possible, if you're gonna do a PMN, generate particle size aer or aer aerosol size distribution and or exposure data. Do it up front, because it's gonna save you a whole lot of hurt, but if you don't have enough uh, respirable particles, they'll leave you alone. So if, if your end use for a PMN has anything to do with potential inhalation, absolutely do that step. And gather as much exposure and release information as possible, that's a no-brainer. Notification cost and timing varies widely, advanced planning is essential, you know, EHS professionals are always under the gun. Market managers and, and R&D managers want you to sell them exactly how long it's going to take and exactly how much it's going to cost. And that's not such an easy thing to do. But if, if you do this homework, at least you can give them, you know, let's walk into this with our eyes open, folks. This is what it looks like. You know, expect the unexpected, and here's what you might see. And that's it. Thank you very much.